Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed the campus's many culinary delights. Um, I'm Jim Quinn. I'm a, um, a professor here in environmental science and policy, and want to join Ted in welcoming you all here today. Um, and thank you. Um, so we have a an interesting lineup of talks this afternoon, and which will end with a session of deciding what it what it's all about and. Um, what, what sorts of resources we all know, need to go forward, and we're looking forward to everybody's participation and all that. Um, we'll start with the interest, very interesting question that we haven't really talked about all so far, which is how to engage citizen science in this whole process. And Sheila Zabin from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center at Tiburon will speak to us. Sheila. Okay, thanks for having me today. And I have to give the disclaimer that Ted asked me to give this talk right before I left for vacation. I came back yesterday, so if, if it doesn't make sense, just raise your hand and, and uh, it'll be a community presentation. Great, okay. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to do right up front is just talk about some of the advantages to working with community scientists. And the main one is, there are many more of them than there are, are of us. And I'm using the term community scientists, trying to get away from saying citizen scientists because we're increasingly aware that um, people might feel if they're not a citizen of a certain country, they, they aren't invited to participate. So we're, we're using the term community science here. There's many more people out in the community than there are professional scientists. And so that gives us potentially greater spatial and temporal coverage for any data that we're interested in collecting. Also, working with the community can potentially increase community awareness of the issue of invasive species and can increase community support or buy-in for any management actions that might follow. In general, also, if people are engaged in the collection of data and making decisions based on, on collected data, this helps to increase scientific literacy, which we all agree is a good thing. And also there's a potential to reach diverse groups that are not typically engaged, certainly in academic science. Um, so what I wanna do is um, go ahead and talk about some examples of community science projects that I've been involved in. Some of these took place in Hawaii where I did my graduate work and some have taken place in California. Some have involved animals, others have involved algae but I think um, that the general idea is easily ap applied across different systems. So there's several ways that citizen scientists can um, interface with us on the issue of invasives. They can do early detection. They can help with surveying and mapping where invasive species are. And they also can help with removals if that is uh, what's decided should be done, as well as follow-up restoration. And so this is the basic uh, overview of my talk. I'm gonna talk about projects that do each of these three things. And then I'll finish up by talking about some considerations that are involved with doing uh, community science. So some examples of early detection. Um, the, the animal that was the focus of my dissertation work in Hawaii is a small barnacle from the Caribbean that was discovered by a wildlife photographer and he photographed it because he was putting together a book on the common organisms that snorkelers were likely to see. So this gives you an idea of how widespread this thing was, and no scientist had detected it um, on, the, on the island of Oahu. So this was found by a wildlife photographer, who then sent it to a taxonomic expert who realized what it was. Also, um, input from the community can give us some insight into how invasive species move around in some of the ways that are unexpected. This um, mussel, the Mediterranean mussel, Middleus gallo provincialis, was um, found by a guy who worked for the Navy in Pearl Harbor who found it in the ballast water tank and called the Bishop Museum in Honolulu saying, I found this weird clam. Can you I've never seen it before. Can you tell me what it is? And it turns out there was a little bit of genetic sleuthing done that these mussels that were in the ballast tank of a resident submarine hadn't moved out of Pearl Harbor 
were the descendants of mussels that had traveled across from Puget Sound to Hawaii on the decommissioned ship, the USS Missouri, which was, then they were, the adult mussels on the ship were seen releasing spawn as they came into Pearl Harbor. And then a few months later, these guys pop up in the ballast water tank. So even though this didn't become established, if this submarine had moved elsewhere to a more temperate area, these could have been transferred. So this gave us a unique insight into some unexpected ways things can move around. And it was all because some guy at the Navy who was cleaning the ballast tank found this. So uh, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, where I work, um, has some pretty extensive programs that are dedicated to detecting um, invasive species using community scientists. And one of our projects involves um, looking for target taxa of some things that we uh, have evidence are sort of moving north from California. Um, and we have a distributed network of um, people involved in uh, looking for these target tax. So most of them are located in Alaska, and in large part that's because we have funding to work there, but also in British Columbia and California. And because a lot of these species are sessile marine invertebrates, we're using fouling panels, which are basically PVC squares that are deployed left in the, in the ocean, um, attached to docks, pulled up some period of time later and examined. And we're also um, looking for the, uh, the European green crab, and so people are looking for that using crab traps. And um, those projects are described on these two websites, Plate Watch, which is for the sessile invertebrates and green crab. Um, and this is a, a panel showing some of the target species, and so people get training to look for specific things that we're concerned may be showing up in their neighborhood soon. And they have data sheets and certain types of data that we train them to collect, and then they submit this to us online. Um, we included a, in our online uh, interface with community scientists uh, a page for the invasive kelp, the Asian kelp, um, Andaria penitifida, um, on this page called Kelp Watch. And um, this is just a screenshot, so I can't, I can't walk you through it. But basically, the idea is we're very interested. At this point, as far as we know, Andaria is the furthest north it is found on this coast is San Francisco Bay. And at this point, it's so widespread in the bay, we don't think eradication is possible given superhuman efforts and amounts of funding. But the idea is if we could get it detected early on in a new incursion north of the bay, we might be able to do some quick action and remove it as it moves north. So we're very interested in people reporting it if they see it north of San Francisco Bay. Um, is, there, is this a pointer? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is the home page, and you can see there's some different tabs here. I don't know if you can read them, but uh, basically there's information. Laser pointer. Okay, great. Okay, so um, there's different tabs that take you through, the, you know, explanations of the life cycle, how you identify it. Um, here's the here's the ID page. There's actually some photos below. If I could have scrolled down, I would. Um, and then there's information about what to do if you see it. There's tabs that um, are targeted towards the boating public. What should boaters do? What, they, what, what can they do? What can aquaculturists do? Um, and then there's a way that you can, if you, if you think you've seen it, you can photograph it and gather a GPS point and, and send that information to us. And you end up with a screen like this, which shows at the bottom, these are the different places where it's been seen, the date, um, where it was, who saw it, and any notes that want to be given, and then you would have a map of, of the sightings. You can also use the map to get your GPS points in. Um, so we tried to get the word out about this website through the distribution of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the watch, a watch card, which I have some with me if you're interested in, in taking any. Um, so this is a small pocket-sized card. We also made one that was laminated so that boaters and scuba divers and other people who are in the water a lot could use it. Um, and then also the poster, which is shown there on the right. Um, 
we, we organized basically a network along the coast all the way up to um, Washington State of different management agencies who agreed to distribute this material and sort of get it out at bait shops and dive shops and other places where people who are interacting with the coastal resource might see it. Um, to try to direct them to be looking for Andaria and to report it to our website if they found it. <clears throat> so we haven't gotten any reports north of San Francisco, and I don't know whether that's because it isn't there or because people haven't heard about, about it. Um, but we did get a new report that came to us not over the, well, it was over the internet, but in the form of a text that was the first report of um, Andaria from the, the Santa Cruz Yacht Harbor. Andaria is known from Monterey and from Pillar Point and Half Moon Bay, so just north and south of Santa Cruz, but hadn't been reported there. And a friend of mine sent me this photo and said, is this it? Uh, and so I asked her for a little bit more information. Well, it could be, does it have a midrib? That's a big identifier. She says, yes, I, it seemed to have one. She tells me where it is. It's pretty beat up looking. And I say, well, they do start to degenerate and break down in the summertime after they've spawned. And she says, well, I'm with my daughter. She's getting a stand-up paddleboard lesson, and I've got to go. Um, so, I, so she says, next week, though, I'll, I'll send you photos. And she did. And I confirmed it. So there it is, the first text discovery of Andaria in a new location. So I show this to you just as an example of the fact that we have all of these tools now that we didn't have, you know, five, 10, certainly not 15 years ago, that allow us to communicate really rapidly with the public and to distribute information. Um, so I wanna just highlight that, note that here. And then I'm gonna talk about um, some projects that involved uh, doing mapping of invasive species. This is critical information for us about where invasive species are and how abundant they are. One project that I worked on as a graduate student in Hawaii was a survey of the rocky intertidal. This was a collaboration between the University of Hawaii graduate departments, local, middle, and high schools, and the Bishop Museum there. Um, after I left, other graduate students took it on and have kept it going. So now there's multiple sites across multiple islands. And students uh, record species composition and abundance. They learn a lot of the, um, the common species and record those. So over the years, we've had a number of publications come out as a result of this work, including the first one that came out, which basically is our justification that these are good data. Okay. And um, critically, this wasn't focused on invasive species, but 33 non-native species were found in the rocky intertidal zone in Hawaii, including five non-native algae. And one of those, the red alga, Acanthophora specifera, is really abundant and common. And so we got really good distribution data on that, not just the sites that it was at, but also where it was in the intertidal zone, other species that it was found with. Okay, so that's a, that was obviously a long-term project that took a lot of investment on our part to pull together, but there's other ways to engage citizens to go out and look very broadly for things, um, such as organizing a bio blitz where you've got a certain, um, a certain time slot over which people sort of fan out and look for key things. The Smithsonian did one in 2010 in Sitka, Alaska. We, we went to 10 different locations there were 25 people that participated, not a huge event, but we did discover a new tunicut, the um, colonial tunicut didendum vexillum, which had not been reported from that location before. On a larger scale and closer to home, in 2014, National Geographic and the National Park System organized a big bio blitz in the Golden Gate National um, uh, Recreation Area, and they they partnered with the mobile app iNaturalist, which if you're not familiar with, is a really cool application where you can take a photograph. Um, when you, at the time that you take a photograph, it, it, it gives it a GPS tag. There's an online community of people who um, then look at it, and if you know what it is, you propose a name. Other people then verify that name by looking at the photograph. If you don't know what it is, you can ask the online community, what is this? and people offer suggestions. And you can see that for this event, here are some of the stats. Um, there were 
over 11,000 observations. Um, over 1,600 species were identified. So this is terrestrial through marine. Um, and close to 400 people participated. These are what the data look like on um, iNaturalist, and these are just for the plants. So again, this wasn't specifically targeted for invasive species, but you could scroll through the plant list and mine these data for invasive plants. Um, on a longer term, more permanent basis, many of you may be familiar with Calflora um, and their, um, their mobile app, which allows you to put in information where you, where you see plants, both native and otherwise. Any non-native species that are on their list then go to a weed mapper, um, which I don't have a picture of here. But those are then used for management decisions. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little, just briefly, about a couple projects that have involved doing removals of non-native species. Here's one <clears throat> that took place in Waikiki. It's still ongoing. It's been in place since um, 20, 2003. Um, removals of Gracilaria salicornia. So you've got divers who are stuffing it into burlap bags, putting it on boogie boards, and there's this human chain that brings it uh, ashore. This is, this is a really popular event. I just checked the m most recent event was in June, and it was overbooked. You couldn't get in to do this. Um, Cirque has been involved in removals of the Atlantic knotweed, Ascophyllum, Nidosum, and several sites in San Francisco Bay. Um, so it showed up in Redwood City in um, 2002. We detected it. We eradicated it. It showed up again five years later at San Leandro Bay. We detected it. It was eradicated two years later. Showed up again in um, 2008, Bay Farm Island in Alameda. It was detected and eradicated. And since that time, it's reappeared in these locations again. We've seen it again. We've removed it again. Um, we've also been involved with removals of the um, Asian kelp, Andaria pinnatifida at several San Francisco Bay marinas and at Pillar Point and Half Moon Bay. And I think I'm out of time to show you what the data look like. We did not eradicate it, but we did make some impacts on both on abundance, which I'm showing here, on mean size, which means we're removing the most reproductive individuals. Um, and I just want to go quickly through some key concerns about community science. First of all, a lot of people are worried about how good the data are. And from my experience, I find that the data can be very good if volunteers are adequately trained. The data that they're collecting are relatively simple, so within the scope of what they're trained to do. And in particular, if the data can be adequately documented, such as can be done easily now with smartphones that, have, that can take photos, take GPS points, other apps are excellent tools for doing this. Then there's the issue of what you do with the data. If you've done really good outreach and a lot of people know about it, you may get flooded with data really quickly, which means you have to be prepared to manage those data. The volunteers are going to want to see and share the data that they collect. And they may also expect a management response if they find something new. And so you need to be prepared to do that or give a good explanation of why you're not going to. Also, volunteers need maintenance. So that means that you need to plan to have adequate staff time to do not just the initial training, but any follow-up trainings. And people get curious, especially in situations where target species are rare, so they're not getting a lot of exciting data back. Or even if they're absent, they're looking for something like Andaria, which isn't showing up yet. There needs to be a way to keep people engaged and interested. And a lot of that's through continued learning about other things they might be seeing. And finally, eradication efforts require long-term investment. We all know that, but I think it's really important, especially when you involve the community, to make sure that the vector is managed so that in the case like with Ascophyllum, it kept coming in, it keeps coming in. It's hard to maintain um, community enthusiasm about continual removal when something keeps showing up. And that you need to be very cautious with promises of success in terms of the eradication effort. So thanks very much for listening, and if we have time for questions, happy to take them otherwise during the break.
How do you get your volunteers? Where do they come from? Um, <clears throat> a variety of sources, and it depends. I think, you know, if you think of the different examples I gave, we reached a pretty broad a group of audiences. So we have some projects that targeted um, kids in school. And so the way that we do that is through teachers, um, reaching out to teachers. Um, in other cases, we work with community organizations like um, Audubon centers or other places that are already involving um, people in sort of nature experiences. Um, so that's an excellent way. They usually have um, volunteer, a volunteer database and people who are already dedicated for showing up. And then some of it is sort of word of mouth, too. Um, in the case of the Andaria, we got um, a mother of three teenagers who, I'm not sure how we found her, but pretty soon she was pulling in whole classrooms of teenagers. And so things can really, really kind of spread that way. I'm curious, how, how effective can hand removal be? Because I know some of these invasions can be pretty extensive. Yeah, so it really depends on the situation. Obviously, the more widespread something is, the more difficult it's going to be to do hand removals. If you don't, if you haven't controlled the vector so that you've got new things coming in all the time, that's going to be a big issue. It also depends on the detectability of your target organism. Um, one of the problems that we've had, that we certainly had with regards to Andaria in San Francisco Bay is it's really murky in the bay. You can't see it. And so if it's floating up on a dock right, right near the water's edge, it's sure, it's easy enough to see it. But if it's down even maybe two feet on a, a typical day in San Francisco Bay, you can't see it even though you're right there. So the likelihood of being able to do hand removals in that situation, I think, is quite low. Um, <clears throat> what they're doing with the Gracilaria in Waikiki is following up hand removals by um, outplanting urchins, native urchins, and they're also trying to raise and restock the area with tang, so a, um, a, an herb herbivorous fish. So combining hand removals with some other tools. I don't really have a question, just a comment. Yeah. Um, in the 18 years that I've worked at CDFA working on invasive plants, other than the rights of way um, s surveys that we would do, I would say the, a significant majority of the plants that we find are simply by a concerned citizen thinking hey, that's something different. Mm -hmm. And I've always put a massive emphasis on just getting that awareness out yeah. and then utilizing the network of, you know, through the county ag biologists, uh, county ag commissioner's offices of getting that um, uh, a place where you can turn to to somebody to identify these these uh, these weeds, but I, I can say from my own experience, at least half the plants populations that I work to eradicate were introduced by by just uh, a concerned citizen. Mm -hmm. So it's very yeah. viable. Yeah, that's our that's our experience too. And with the uh, Andaria network, what we were hoping was that we'd have partners all along the coast, so that if somebody finds it in Southern Oregon. You know, we don't, we don't have the, the funding to go to Southern Oregon to look at it, but that there would be somebody they could take it to to look at it. And I think that's the way to go to maximize um, resources for that type of response. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so... Um, Next, we have uh, uh, Patrick Moran from uh, USDA, who's going to talk on biological control and area-wide integrated adaptive management of weeds. So, Patrick. Yeah, so um, just an outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start to and give you some... Oh, I'm sorry. Slow. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, so what I'm, I'm going to start today um, and talk about uh, some of the theory and uh, practice of biological weed control. And uh, a lot of this comes from terrestrial weeds, not aquatics. There's more of a history and, and practice in, in terrestrial weeds. I'll talk about, I was specifically asked to talk about risk assessment for biocontrol. And I'll focus that first in terms of general risk assessment factors and then some of the aquatic weeds that are either under, that are being targeted for biocontrol in the delta. So the current status. And then I'll talk about this integrated adaptive weed uh, management, a uh, number of different forms of control in the delta under the uh, USDA ARS funded area-wide pest management project. So obviously invasive plants are a big deal um, nationally and in California. The, the weed lists are long. There's relatively a uh, small number among that list that are probably incurring the highest cost. In other words, have the most widespread distribution. And those are the ones which typically get targeted for biocontrol, the ones which have spread beyond the feasibility of other control methods. So of course, aquatic weeds across the US and in California, huge amount of damage. We've talked about it this morning, um, especially in, in, in the Delta, a number of aquatic weeds incurring uh, major costs for control, and then the environmental damage, which isn't necessarily quantified beyond that. And then the, uh, the talk this, this morning by Shruti, suggesting that the um, abundance and potentially the diversity of the aquatic weeds increasing in the Delta in recent years. So what is biological control in terms of just the fundamental definition? Well, there's, there's a natural, natural phenomena that occur between predators and prey, the, the ability of a predator to uh, reduce the density of a prey item below what it would be without, in the absence of the predator. So that just um, occurs without any human intervention. And then the approach for invasive pests, the manipulative introduction of a natural enemy to reduce a pest population below levels at which it would be without the pest. And so this involves in control of insect pests in greenhouses, in the field, and also weeds. Um, different types of organisms, organisms can be used for biocontrol. Uh, I work with insects as biologic control agents of weeds, but pathogens, plant pathogens, have also been uh, used or, or studied as biocontrol agents of weeds and insects. And even, uh, for example, triploid grass carp being used as a biocontrol agent of hydrilla in uh, Southern California. So the basic idea uh, for invasive, non-native invasive weeds is that they, they're being introduced without the presence of their co-adapted natural enemies from the native range. They're therefore free to cycle seasonally and gradually increase their populations to the point where they become an economic problem. Introduce a natural enemy and reduce the population of the weed to a lower, lower equilibrium where it uh, falls below the level of causing severe economic and environmental damage. You notice that the weed is not being eradicated. It's being reduced to a lower density. So again, reducing it below that economic threshold. And sometimes several biological control agents, as we call them, in the case of weeds, mostly insects, have to be introduced to achieve this lower equi equilibrium level. So in terms of uh, biocontrol projects involving uh, weeds as targets and insects, there's a number of stages in the project, uh, a bunch of uh, upfront expenses and time that has to be spent to develop a biocontrol project. Similar to other forms of control, you know, developing a new herbicide, for example. Uh, in the case of biocontrol, it's finding natural enemies, which might be host-specific or feed only on the target weed, verifying that they are host-specific using laboratory testing and native range testing. Uh, also verifying that they're efficacious, that they have significant impacts on the weed, going through a, a regulatory process to get a permit to release one or more agents, and then testing them in the field, releasing them and evaluating the impact, tech, transferring the technology. And biocontrol projects are highly dis interdisciplinary nowadays, all the way from molecular biology to landscape ecology. So a lot of different fields involved. The benefits of biocontrol have been demonstrated uh, in, a num in a number of cases where efficacious or effective agents have been released. The benefit to cost ratios can be as high as 300 to 1. 70% uh, of the agents released in the past 20, 25 years have established populations. In the U.S., a relatively limited number of weeds have been targeted with biocontrol since about the 1940s. And Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, they've, they've been actually been even a little bit more aggressive in, more, in recent years in targeting some of the invasive weeds. Uh, the pictures here so, show some of the classic success stories in the western U.S. Of course, these are not aquatic, but tansy ragwort, klamath weed, Mediterranean sage, dramatic reductions in impact as the result of an introduction of one or, or two or three uh, biologic control agents. The biggest success story in California for the aquatics so far is giant salvinia. 
in far southern California, in the Colorado River, uh, USDA APHIS has been releasing a weevil, the giant Salvinia weevil, developed originally in the eastern U.S. Um, as a biocontrol agent. They have to re-release it every year, so they produce it in, under controlled conditions and then release it, and it has the impact you see there. Disadvantages of biocontrol are there is a high upfront cost to develop biologic control agents to make sure that they're safe to release into the environment, that they don't feed on native plants, crop plants, to also verify they're efficacious. And then to, you know, to do that research, develop the insects. So again, we're talking about non-native weeds and non-native insects in this context. Uh, it's a slow method of control. And uh, of course, it doesn't eradicate the weed, but neither does any other control method for these weeds that have achieved huge distributions. There's no way you're going to eradicate it using any control method. Now, I was specifically asked to talk about the risks of biocontrol, so I'll go over a number of different risk categories. Uh, things like, for example, conflict of interest, uh, weed adaption or evolution, either before a biocontrol agent is released or after, either a new biocontrol agent not, not establishing damaging populations, uh, non-target damage after the agent is released, uh, causing non-target damage to other plants, Indirect effects, uh, the uh, presence of the biocontrol agent on the weed leads to ecological effects and the replacement of one invasive weed by another. And so all of these factors can be evaluated theoretically before an agent is released, in some cases empirically in the native range or in the laboratory, and then some can only be fully evaluated after agent release, uh, for example, indirect effects, things like that. But even in those cases, the risk is minimized before the agent is released under the modern uh, paradigm of, of the process. So in terms of conflicts of interest, this is pretty easy to resolve before even starting a project. Does, it, does a weed have a beneficial use? A couple of terrestrial examples there, ice plant and pampas grass, for example, having use um, in the past or present as an ornamental plant. Uh, ice plant, this, the, these, those two uh, weeds there are, are potential targets that we're considering working on in our laboratory at the USDA. Uh, because they do have some damaging impacts, but we have to resolve those conflicts of interest. In the aquatic realm, uh, water yellow primrose, a bunch of native species and at least one or two exotic species have some nice potentially ornamental value, at least in the past, but causing big problems in the delta now. Even Arundo did have some beneficial uses when it was introduced, uh, construction, erosion control, and uh, the question is, uh, it's, it's clearly causing some damage now, um, so those, those conflicts of interest are in the past. There are ways you can try to resolve these conflicts of interest. Of course, with chemical and mechanical control, you can just not spray the beneficial population or just not pull it out. But for biocontrol, you have insects that are dispersing, and so you have to con consider the possibility of, of running into conflict there. In terms of weed uh, evolution or adaptation, there's a number of theories that have been going around to explain why weeds are invasive. And this, this is not necessarily just biocontrol. This is just why weeds come in and just dominate habitats. And one, one idea is the evolution of increased competitive ability. The invasive populations grow faster, reproduce faster, use resources more efficiently. There's also the idea of shifting defense. Uh, plants, most plants or all plants are defended by different kinds of chemical or physical defenses. There's what we call qualitative defenses that tend to repel generalist insects but attract specialist insects. So biocontrol agents are specialists. So these toxins actually attract the specialists. And then there's also quantitative defenses that are more like anti-digestion anti uh, things like tannins, phenolics, that tend to um, uh, make it tougher for specialists to use the plant. So the idea is that invasive populations, with, this is within the same species, so an invasive population shifts away from qualitative defenses, or actually no, increases more um, in qualitative defenses and decreases quantitative defenses. All, there's also the idea of alter, altered tolerance to herbivory. So invasive populations be, are more tolerant just because they grow faster. Also, do they become more tolerant after an agent is released? So one, one idea of evidence against the idea of post-release tolerance is that Old agents are still effective. Uh, Klamath weed and, and, uh, and uh, some of those other ones are still, still effective a long time after. They're still going after the weed. So the weed doesn't appear to be evolving or changing in terms of tolerance in those cases. Uh, just some examples of how this might work. Um, and, and the idea for this is with Chinese tallow tree, not, not, again, not an aquatic plant, uh, wetland plant, Chinese tallow tree in Texas, the invasive populations growing faster than the native range populations. The idea of defenses shifting, again, within Chinese tallow tree, investing more in the qualitative flavonoid toxins, and um, 
and less in the, uh, in the quantitative toxins. This could actually increase biocontrol impact because the specialist insects are actually attracted to those, to those uh, qualitative toxins, you know, those, those, those things which scare away the generalists. The idea that invasive populations within the same species are more tolerant, they can tolerate a higher level of damage. Now these topics haven't really been addressed very much for aquatic weeds. Either cases where we already have successful biocontrol agents, uh, water hyacinth, giant salvine, and, and alligator weed, there are areas where biocontrol has been successful. This could be addressed with these weeds um, or with other uh, new weeds and new targets. So one way to uh, evaluate this with, for new agents is to, for example, we're doing this right now with French broom, again, not an aquatic, but we have a psyllid that we're considering in quarantine for French broom. We're evaluating the survival and reproduction of, a of candidate agents on native and introduced populations, genotypes, so the same species, just different seed sources, and also evaluating comparing the impact between the native and invasive populations. And that's a way to sort of validate that the agent will be effective on the invasive populations. So um, uh, the, the next category of risk is failure to establish. And so this can arise from a num number of reasons. For example, climatic incompatibility. Um, these weeds, of course, have native, different native ranges. Within that vast native range, in this case, Arundo, there's certain areas where the biocontrol agents occur. For example, we have two biocontrol agents, which, uh, which I'll talk about for Arundo. And they only occur in the Western Mediterranean, around Spain, France, Italy, um, a little bit into Greece not really the rest of that native range. So therefore you can do climate matching, there's software to do this and determine certain areas that match well to, to where the areas where the agents are candidate, in this case, you know, candidate agents come from. And you can, you can uh, predict that the agents will do well in the invasive range. There always is gonna be microclimatic site to site variability, variability in the success just based on local factors. Gen uh, target weed genetic Genotypic incompatibility is another uh, reason why biocontrol agents may fail to establish populations. You can determine the source of the invasive weed populations. In this case, Arundo, uh, we did microsatellite work and verified that the invasive populations came from southern Spain, um, Mediterranean uh, area of Spain, and this is also where uh, we found the biocontrol agents. So we were able to bring biocontrol agents from those areas that, we, that would have the best chance of doing well on the Arundo genotypes present in North America. And you can also do uh, genetic work on the agents themselves. Look at the genetic diversity of the agents within, within the native range. So uh, what about agents that do establish populations but don't have impact? So uh, there's, there's course, you, there's, you can evaluate the effic efficacy of candidate agents in quarantine and also in the native range. You can even use insecticides to uh, protect the weed in its native range and then see if the agents, see what the impact of the agents is under those cases. This picture here is, is from Florida showing the impact of a total of five biocontrol agents that they have there for water hyacinth. You see a dramatic decrease in the size of the plants here. In comparison to the delta, we only have one biocontrol agent for water hyacinth established, potentially more in the future. Uh, in the case of Arundo, what I'm showing there are pre-release evaluations of impact for both the Arundo wasp and the Arundo armored scale, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, we showed that they did have impact on the plant, either in labor laboratory studies, greenhouse studies, or in the native range. So um, not the, the next category of risk is non-target plant damage. So once the agent is released, does it have impact on non-target plants? There's a well-established method for doing host range testing for new candidate biocontrol agents. It's the phylos, phylocentric centrifugal method emphasizes taxonomy. And of course, we have molecular tools now to have uh, improved taxonomy, phylogenies of different plant families. We can predict which plants are most likely to be attacked. Uh, we can look at the native plants um, in the area we're going to release the agent, what are the closest native relatives of the weed and test those. You can then move further out into the next gen genus, into the next tribe, next subfamily, outside the family if necessary. In the case of, of water hyacinth, for example, uh, the, the water hyacinth plant hopper, about 70, insect, 70 plants were tested moving outward in this circle here and uh, finding that the, the plant hopper was not able to complete development under field conditions on any plant other than water hyacinth and that led to a permit uh, to release it in North America. So just a, a sort of a recent, a number of recent surveys and some concerns in, in the literature about non-target damage. This is just a statistic from a recent paper showing that 
Um, the vast majority of biocontrol agents have not even had a nibble of damage in a non-target plant. There's only two cases which are both present in the U.S. where a biocontrol agent has had a significant impact on a non-target plant. Rhinocillus conicus, which is um, a weevil that was released for certain thistle species, causing damage to native thistles in the northern plains and uh, central U.S. And then also some of you may have heard about Cactoblastis cactorum, the cactus moth, which was never released in the U.S. It's important to realize that it came into the U.S. on its own, released in the Caribbean for control of native, native uh, cacti, which is really not, not a wise practice. Uh, we don't do biocontrol of native weeds, even if they do become invasive. We, fo we focus on non-native invasive weeds. Uh, so another uh, interesting aspect of biocontrol risk is indirect or food web effects. So does the biocontrol agent provide a subsidy for native or non-native predators, which leads to negative impacts on other herbivores, either that occur on the weed or on other plants? It's a pretty simple idea to begin with. You just, uh, you, the, the, the predator or parasitoid latches on to the biocontrol agent and starts exploiting it. This rather complicated set of graphs or tables on the right there is for Australian acacias and a galling wasp. Um, on the left is in, Austra in its native range in um, Australia, it's attacked, this wasp is attacked by a whole suite of parasitoids and also inquilines, which are uh, other insects that live inside the gall, feed on the gall tissue, might feed on the, on the, gall, on the wasp itself. But in the introduced range, there's very few associations between parasitoids and the biocontrol agent. So, a lot, so, so the idea is that these, these um, associations aren't expected to build up over time. They, it's really tough to evaluate these before release. Usually this has to be done post-release. You can, however, do some, make some predictions based on the na natural enemies that occur in the native range of the biocontrol agent as to how susceptible it's going to be to getting latched onto by the local pa parasites and predators after release. So the final aspect of risk is um, because biocontrol agents are host-specific, you're just going to replace one weed with another weed. If we successfully get rid of the water hyacinth, we'll re be replaced by Lugwigia based on the remote sensing data we're hearing today, the Lugwigia like, is increasing. Or how about Arundo being replaced by buffalo grass? If, for example, in Texas where we have some, some successful biocontrol of Arundo happening. So this is not a problem which is intrinsic or specific to biocontrol. It's just a struggle with any kind of control that you can have succession from one weed after another. So in terms of the uh, invasive aquatic weeds in the delta and what's going on, we do have, there's just this rogues gallery here of different aquatic plants. And I wanted to go through some of the risk assessment that's been done um, with some of, um, that's some of these, uh, these aquatic weeds. The top three weeds there, the water hyacinth, the rundo, and Brazilian waterweed, are the uh, focus of the Arundo, um, area, the, excuse me, the area-wide project for um, invasive weed management, uh, aquatic invasive weed management in the Delta. So in the case of water hyacinth, of course, uh, four agents have been released in California, two, two established. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers released two weevils and a moth. And uh, one weevil did establish in the Delta. Uh, plant hopper is the in insect that CDFA released originally a few years ago, established at one site outside the Delta, not in the Delta. The risk assessment here is actually pretty good in terms of uh, host range non-target effects. Um, there's relatively few non-target plants in California on which these agents could feed to begin with. And of course, before the release, we, that it's verified that the, that the agents are safe. But if we wanted to release new insects, we'd have to test these, these plants. So the hyacinth uh, is actually considered a success story in the tropics for these uh, weevils having dramatic impacts. The plant hopper there, the water hyacinth plant hopper developed by the USDA lab in Fort Lauderdale, Florida as being safe for release and still, still new in California. Um, I like uh, planning to release it in the Delta. Uh, we're going through some process now to see uh, about some, some consultations you might need to do t before we do that. Uh, so just in terms of integrated control, I want to talk a little bit about how biocontrol can be integrated. It doesn't have to be standalone. Uh, with water hyacinth, for example, the weevils uh, and chemicals can work together. Sublethal doses of the chemicals can keep the plants going long enough for the weevils to increase their impact. On the left there with 2,4-D and glyphosate. On the right is some work I did in Texas in tanks uh, looking at uh, how herbicides and biocontrol can interact. In the case of panoxylum, for example, increasing or decreasing the time to death, increasing the, the rate of death of the plants in response to the herbicide. So in terms of Arundo, uh, this, this is a case where agents have already been released in the U.S. Uh, two insects have been released in Texas and California. So the risk assessment has been done. The, the, the non-target effects, are, have been, the, the insects are safe for release, even though there are, of course, a lot of grass species in California. 
This is just a picture, pictures of the insects, the Arundo stem galling wasp, and the impact that we've seen in Texas, where it has a little bit more of a history. It's been released since about 2007. In Northern California, it's more recent. We hope to see these impacts. And then the, uh, the, the uh, Arundo armored scale, showing a more complicated life cycle, about a six month life cycle, and showing impact, show, starting to show impact in Texas, doesn't disperse nearly as well as the wasp, so it's gonna take longer to see the impact there. Brazilian waterweed is a case where we have initiated some preliminary biocontrol studies. We've already rejected one potential agent because of non-target feeding in quarantine in the laboratory um, on that native plant. A relatively small number of native plants need to be tested if we can find new candidate biocontrol agents. This still is on our radar, essentially, as a potential biocontrol target. Water yellow primrose, also potentially, uh, because we do have good collaborations, I should mention, with a South American laboratory in, um, in Argentina where these weeds are native, that both the Egeria and the water yellow primrose. So we have, we have potential agents that we could bring into quarantine and study, potentially challenging a lot of native species, um, not necessarily in the genus, but in the family that, that would need potentially be of concern that would have to be tested. Uh, we do have a, some very good work being done right now on the genetic identity of the California populations. Uh, Brenda Gruel is a scientist in our unit who is looking at this. South American sponge plant, we haven't initiated any biocontrol. Um, pretty short non-target list in terms of at least that family to test. Curly leaf, curly leaf pond weed, we haven't initiated any biocontrol. Um, potentially the most challenging, there's a lot of native Potomagedon in California. And, and, this, and of course, the very the valued Stachinia species as well. So but this could potentially be a very challenging target to find something which would be safe uh, to release just on the curly leaf pond weed. So I guess I'm running a little bit over or about to, but I wanted to go, spend a couple of minutes talk about the um, area-wide project for, uh, for integrated adaptive management. This is a project that, were, that was funded last year by the USDA ARS, received some additional funding this year. Um, the idea behind this project is that there's been a lot of efforts to control aquatic weeds in the delta, chemical control, mechanical control, water hyacinth, egeria, arundo. And the problem is that these efforts have been diligent and substantial, but the weeds are still causing severe problems. We have this long-term problem. There's also the issue of um, agencies being able to communicate with each other. And, and having sufficient information to optimize the control. So what we, what we heard about this morning, the remote sensing, for example, in, in improving the level of information that agencies have. And then finally, as I just mentioned, um, different stakeholders talking to each other, the ports, the water agencies, the homeowners, the boaters, the natural resource agencies. There's a lot of, thing, a lot of things going on in the Delta. It's a very special and, and important place. And trying to bring these agencies together is a motivating factor. So the idea is to, is to try to move from a control paradigm where you have some success, but you have a lot of random factors that interfere with successful, successful control, and you have instead moved to a different kind of paradigm where you have integrated adaptive management, you have geospatial modeling, like what Dave, what Dave Bubenheim talked about this morning, you have the remote sensing, you have knowledge of weed growth under different conditions, you have all the different control methods involved, chemical, mechanical, physical, cultural, and biological, to lead to improved delta-wide control of, in this case, water hyacinth, Egeria, and Arundo. Those are the fo focus of the area-wide project. But these technologies could be applied to other weeds as well. Different project partners, the USDA ARS, uh, different, uh, mostly doing the research to uh, improve control methods. Uh, Boating and Waterways, of course, does the chemical control, the mechanical control. They receive information from NASA. They contribute information a key stakeholder, key partner there. NASA, as we heard from uh, this morning, um, developing, uh, the, doing the remote sensing, other remote sensing technologies, the uh, plant growth models, water nutrient models, the Delta SWAT model that, that Dave talked about this morning. University of California doing studies of mosquitoes. So mosquitoes potentially being harbored in the aquatic weeds, especially water hyacinth, maybe Lugwigia. USDA ourselves, we're working on that as well. We're doing research, trying to quantify this association. And plant science is involved with the outreach program and plant growth studies. We also have a bioeconomic model uh, right here in UC Davis. We have an economist looking at the impacts of the weeds and the potential benefits of the area-wide project. And the mosquito vector control districts are involved. They're do they have a critical public health mission. They're providing information on the aquatic weeds and the mosquito association. And we're contributing information to improve their, 
controllability. Uh, Sacramento San Joaquin Delta Conservancy has an Arundo control program that they've initiated. It started with a mapping project, and I've used this information, for example, to try to find biocontrol sites for the Arundo agents. They're, they're using it to do chemo prioritized chemical control. So there, there are different kinds of benefits there, basically to improve control and uh, lead to uh, better, you know, better sustainable control of, of those three weeds, the water hyacinth, the Gary, and Arundo. And uh, we, have, we have meetings on a regular basis, and uh, the idea is, to again, to bring the stakeholders together, synergize the efforts. So I think I'm out of time, so, but uh, I can take questions, I guess, during the break if I don't have time now. So. Hi there. Uh, so quick question. Have you ever looked at anything aside from insects as agents of biological control, such as other species of SAV or any other aquatic vegetation? You mean talking about like allelopathy, like using native aquatic plants? There, there is some evidence yes. for that in the terms of restoration that some of these native plants can kind of push out the exotics. Um, once, but in order to do that, first you have to sort of get over the hump and achieve you know, some level of control, and then that the, you can sort of strategize on which natives can be introduced. Um, that might you know keep keep the invasives out. That's something which um, which I haven't worked on personally myself, but I've have seen a lot of information on that in other other parts of the U.S. And I know in the Delta, there's a lot of restoration projects going on. And that's something that's something we do want to work on as part of the area-wide project too. Once we're able to get get the weeds uh, down to a little bit more a little bit lower level, we can start exploiting some restoration opportunities. Um. Thank you, Patrick. So one of the things I've discovered in 25 years or so of being frustrated by invasive species databases is that whenever you look, Florida seems to be more organized than we are. So we've taken this occasion to invite some visitors from Florida to share their experience. And first is Jeff Shard, who's re recently retired from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and we'll talk about Florida's adaptive aquatic plant management program. Appreciate the invitation to be here and to be relevant once again. Um, after 39 years of aquatic plant management in Florida, I retired three months ago at the end of, of May. Um, what I'd like to do today is um, talk to you about the, the policies or procedures or administrations or impl implementation of Florida's aquatic plant management program and not so much information about how to control aquatic plants. Those kinds of things need to be left up to the people um, in this particular area here. Um, some background information for me, since I don't know most of you in here. I spent five years in biological controls, grass carp, um, to control hydrilla in the 1970s. In the early 1980s, seven years of um, regulatory program, we developed Florida's aquatic plant control permitting program as well as compliance program for people who are operating under those permits as well as contractors that the state's paying to control aquatic plants. And we also implemented in the early 1980s an annual inventory for aquatic plants in all of Florida's 460 public lakes and rivers. And for the last 27 years, I've been the coordinator for the aquatic plant management program that's funded by the state of Florida in those 460 waters. And our accomplishments during that period were to develop not only control priorities, but also funding priorities to make sure that invasive plants all over the state are kept under good maintenance control in the state. And finally, in the last couple of years, I've written Florida's pesticide discharge management plan, which was one of the requirements for NPDES regulations that became effective in Florida in 2010. So that's background for me, some for the state. Again, 460 public lakes and rivers that cover about a million and a quarter acres. On those annual inventories that I talked about, we generally find 20 to 25 non-native 
aquatic plant species in those systems, and the percent means that just about every water body in Florida has at least one non-native aquatic plant species. Fourteen of those species are considered to be invasive. This current fiscal year, um, there are active management programs going on in 433 of those water bodies, ranging from a couple hundred dollars to several million dollars, depending on the size of the lake or the problem. Um, over the last five years, the average um, is about 70,000 acres of aquatic plants controlled statewide each year in public waters at a cost of just under $20 million. We also have about 7,200 active uh, permits issued out there. Um, that does not show many of the mechanical harvesting permits or hand removal permits because those in most cases will meet exemptions from permitting. So most of the permits are for the use of herbicides. Uses of Florida water, certainly the um, water chemistries are, are, are different in Florida than they are in California, but we've seen through the years that the uses of Florida waters are pretty similar to the use of waters all across the country. Starting in the upper left and working counterclockwise, boating is extremely important in Florida. We have about an eight month growing season, so warm water in the northern part of the state and 12 months in the southern part of the state. So water skiing, um, Swimming, um, fishing, duck hunting are all extremely important in Florida waters year round. There are 13 drinking water intakes in surface uh, public waters in Florida. Agriculture is extremely important in Florida. Um, citrus, sod, and vegetables are all very important and all draw water from surface public waters in Florida. We also have um, a little bit of commercial navigation you see in the bottom right. And what's very important in Florida is it's so flat that most water bodies connect to one another and eventually out to the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean ocean through either a natural or a human-made um, connection. So it's extremely important to keep plants under control around those structures or in those conveyances so that when the tropical storm season comes, we don't have problems there. And then finally, all Florida waters are important for fish and wildlife habitat. We have an adaptive management program and it's been in effect for about 40 years, long before adaptive management became sort of a uh, part of the jargon that people are using lately. And by that I mean that we look at the uses and functions of water bodies all the time and base our management programs on what the uses of those water bodies are. So in this case, we can ask the humans that are using that water body to get out of the system or curtail the use of the system if we're using a pesticide that might have some sort of a, a human use restriction, but we can't do that with listed species, plants or animals. So every program that we design has to take into account not just the human uses or activities for that system, but also anything else that may be going on in the watershed. We subscribe in Florida to the National Invasive Species Council definition of invasive plant, and that means it's non-native to the ecosystem, and it can cause or likely cause economic or environmental harm. Now, we're not restricted to only controlling invasive species. We have the flexibility in our program to control any plant, native, non-native, or invasive, if it's impairing with the identified uses and functions of that water body. The management approach is for the invasive species is to eradicate new populations. That's not just new to the state, but also new to that particular water body to prevent long-term maintenance. And in Florida, that usually means costs and herbicide use. If a plant becomes established, then we shift over to maintenance control, and that means keep that invasive species at the lowest possible levels that we can, commensurate with the water uses and functions, the current conditions in the system, the technology, and the funding that might be available for us. We have all of these management components, and I'm gonna spend most of my time on the white one there, the aquatic plant management program. We also have an invasive upland plant management program as well. Prevention is a good idea, but um, prevention has its weaknesses and plants eventually find their ways into waters. So you always have to be looking over your shoulder in those water bodies. We conduct annual assessments of the aquatic plants in all those public waters for three reasons. Uh, first is for new detections. Second is to establish our management priorities for that given year. And the third is to evaluate not just the effect, the cost effectiveness of the control programs, but also if we don't do control programs, what kinds of impacts might the invasive plants be having on the, 
the non-target or the native plants in the community. I don't know if you can see here, but that's water hyacinth. That's overwhelming a stand of very valuable native bulrush in a system in Florida in a lake where the water hyacinth weren't controlled that year. So there are also implications for not managing plants as well as for controlling them. These assessments are carried out by 19 biologists that are established in nine offices around the state. We have one lead agency in the state of Florida. The program, Invasive Plant Management Program, gets shifted about every 10 years in Florida from one agency to another, but there's always still just one agency that is the overarching um, lead agency for the um, development of the management programs in the state of Florida. Our management priorities <clears throat> are similar to what I saw in the draft programs here as they are here in California, um, floating plants, water hyacinth and water lettuce, and then also um, hydrilla or submersed plants. We don't have egeria or much of it in Florida, and we don't have much Eurasian water milfoil. The waters are usually too warm for that, or where they used to exist, they've been outcompeted by hydrilla. So you usually only see Eurasian water milfoil in the mouths of some of the um, Gulf Coast rivers where hydrilla doesn't seem to be able to survive the salinities down there. So we get all the way down to priority level six before we get into the control of other noxious plants, and that's native or invasive plants. Um, and that's usually where our 20 to $25 million budget runs out down in that particular level. So water hyacinth, water lettuce, we've seen enough about that today that you know what they are, at least water hyacinth you know, water lettuce in the upper right. Here's what an infestation of water lettuce looks like on a North Florida river and on the right hand side is a mechanical harvester trying to keep up with the growth of water hyacinth and water lettuce on the or internal rim canal on the south end of Lake Okeechobee. Um, hydrilla is our second management priority, but we spend more funding on hydrilla simply because it's more expensive to control an acre of hydrilla. It can grow to 35 feet in Florida waters. That's as deep as we found it in spring vents where there's enough light to get to that. Um, that's significant because an average Florida water body is about 10 or 12 feet deep. So it can grow in most Florida waters if it can get enough light to grow in those systems. We're fairly good at controlling the um, above ground portion, but we heard earlier on reports here in California, you see the same thing. It's very difficult to manage those tubers or turions that are present in the sediments by the millions per acre. Dry climate, I'm not used to getting away from the humidity in the southeast. Um, the literature shows or demonstrates that hydrilla can expand by about an inch or two a day during the peak growing season from the apical meristem. But recent research done by Mike Netherland and others at the Corps of Engineers demonstrated during the peak growing season in Florida from June through September, the stems also can elongate by as much as six to eight inches per day. So hydrilla can quickly grow from the, the substrates up to the surface in a matter of just a few weeks during the peak growing season. That's backwards. And form those dense tangles that we saw that um, were discussed earlier in the day. And then finally what happens is it tops over with a mat of filamentous algae if you're not constantly managing to control those mats in Florida waters. So that can cause the wide fluctuations in oxygen and pH that you heard about earlier today, as well as limit light and oxygen um, penetration into the system. So after about a growing season or two like this, there are no plants or animals underneath that map. We have an early detection rapid response program in Florida. At the beginning of the year, we hold back about a million dollars and then slowly meter that money out during the year. Have eradication programs to try to get to keep Salvinia molesta and Philianthus fluitans at the bottom, two floating plants out of the state, no matter where we find them in public or private waters, and then two emergent plants as well. We have eradication programs. To do that and to manage our maintenance programs, we have 46 contracts. So the second part of the rapid response is to have somebody who can go out on that system tomorrow if you find a new infestation of a plant. So we have at least two contractors, management contractors available for any water body, public uh, lake or quarter acre pond if we see one of those plants like Salvinia molesta um, in a Florida water body.
Through the years, research has developed um, about 60 management tools that are available for us to consider for aquatic plant management among those four basic control options. And we also take into um, account environmental conditions that can help us with our management programs. You just heard about a lot about biological control, so I won't do too much there. Uh, very successful with alligator weed, not very successful with the uh, insects released to control hydrilla. Um, water hyacinth biocontrols are pretty good at stressing plants, reducing the vigor of the plants, as well as the flowering of the plants, so lowering seed production, but we still have to do very intensive um, management of water hyacinth in Florida. We have released uh, sterile grass carp in about 110 public lakes. Most of those are small lakes, less than 500 acres, because we found that releasing them in larger systems, the control doesn't gen generally translate to those big systems. It's either an all or none um, program when you get into those big systems. In the small lakes, we can put small amounts of fish in and integrate that with mechanical or biocontrols and keep hydrilla under control in those systems. We also have 20, almost 27,000 permits issued to, uh, for grass carp in Florida, small ponds uh, throughout the state. Mechanical controls have been around since the initiation of the program back in 1899. That's when the water hyacinth program began in, in Florida. Um, Physical labor gave way to uh, mechanical devices that would lift hyacinth out of the water or shred it in place. You move forward 100 years and we still have those same basic technologies, uh, the machines that lift the plants out of the water. And up right, there you see a harvester taking out a raft of Ludwigia grandiflora that we talked about earlier. And this is about the only information I have for you for Ludwigia other than beware of this plant. It is nasty, fast growing and very expensive. It's been in the state for about 25 years and just became a problem about five years ago, almost identical to what you heard earlier today. Um, we spent a half million dollars controlling about a thousand acres of Ludwigia last year. Uh, we also shred plants, um, so we still have those opportunities, but for invasive plants, we see that the mechanical controls just can't keep up with the rapid growth of those invasive species. We have all these cultural and physical methods to control plants. Most aren't used on a very large scale. The asterisks are next to drawdown and flooding. We can't often completely dry out a water body in Florida because of the um, persistent rains, but we can lower the water levels and therefore use the amount of herbicides that are applied when controlling submerged plant species. Then once their herbicides start to have an impact on the plants, then reflood that system, reducing the light and then further stressing um, hydrilla in that particular system. In 2000, we had six herbicide compounds available to manage aquatic plants in Florida and 15 different formulations of those herbicides. 2000 is significant because that's when we also got confirmation that we had fluoridone resistant. You see there's four um, formulations, but fluoridone resistance um, in hydrilla in the state of Florida. That generated a lot of research among the state of Florida, researchers, industry, and EPA to fast track the registration of new compounds. What this left us with in 2000 is the red are the formulations that were available to control hydrilla. About 12 tools were available, now, but now we had eight, and most of those, copper, diquat, and endothol, had only been used for small scale or spot treatments. And we had been doing 25,000 um, acre treatments on hydrilla when we were using fluoridone. So we weren't able to do much large scale control, and that's why we needed that fast act um, or fast track um, herbicide registration. So that today there are 16 compounds and 29 formulations available to select from in the state of Florida. Uh, there are 91 trade names under those. Um, Herbicide compounds in our NPDES records show that 48 of those trade names were applied last year. Um, so now we have about 20 herbicide tools to select from uh, in controlling hydrilla. Need for multiple um, modes of action or active ingredients is because different target plants react differently to herbicides. Also different non-target plants react differently to herbicides and it's 
at least as important or in some cases more important for us to conserve the non-target plants or the native plants as it is to control hydrilla in Florida. Some of those herbicides are only effective for spot control. Others are more effective for large-scale applications, um, especially the contact versus the systemic herbicides. Um, and certainly important for resistance management, and we've uh, come face to face with that in three different occasions with three different herbicides in the state of Florida for aquatic plant management. The herbicide registration process, you know that EPA registers the compounds for U.S. waters, then each of the states is responsible for registering in that pr particular state. It's the Florida Department of Agriculture that registers products in Florida waters during which period all the environmental and health agencies can comment on not just new compounds but new uses or new sites uh, that are under consideration for registration. Since the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation, that's the latest agency that's um, overseeing invasive plant management in Florida, permits and contracts use of herbicides, the agency feels compelled to also conduct research, not just on the rates, but selectivity, timing, and any synergistic effects we might see with herbicide use. Once a herbicide's registered, or just before it looks like it's going to be registered, especially for submersed plant control, then we contract with the university system or the Corps of Engineers to do VAT studies to not only see the activity that there might be for hydrilla, but also on non-target submersed plants, then move to ponds, then to small lakes, and then to large-scale um, application of those particular herbicides and that usually can take about two growing seasons or two years to go from registration before we're ready comfortable with using a herbicide on a large-scale system. So for the last 45 years the, just the state agency has spent about um, 25 million dollars on 220 different research projects for aquatic plant control. Most important is the biology and physiology of the plant, especially seed production and propagule viability, finding weaknesses in the life cycle to know when best to attack the invasive species to conserve or enhance the native plants, and then also um, to see the susceptibility um, to the available controls, but again, um, impacts to non-target organisms. If a herbicide is registered and is very effective at hydrilla control, but it controls most of the other plants in that system, the state of Florida probably will not use it, not in a, a, a public waterway, maybe in canal systems or a golf course pond, something like that. So areas where we've spent most of those research funds are on biological control. The agency doesn't do any of that. It's all contracted with USDA and foreign countries to do the overseas exploration and the um, quarantine work. Um, not much has been spent on mechanical harvesting. You see by the state, that's because most of the mechanical harvesting research that's been done in Florida has been sponsored by the US Army Corps of Engineers. So it's not reported in this graph here. We don't have ice in Florida, so we don't have that environmental control, but we do have those pesky tropical storms that'll blow across the peninsula from time to time. Two things in this picture. Once, that is not the time to start thinking, do we have the plants under control in those flood control systems just before you receive um, 15 to 20 inches of rainfall in a day or two? The other is, once a system like that goes through, it can cause some extreme environmental disruption. Um, Florida was hit by four major hurricanes in 2004 and 2005 that not only uprooted hydrilla, but literally blew it out of the systems. So we took a much more aggressive approach because for about two years after those hurricanes, there was extreme turbidity, tannins, algae blooms, and waters were five to six feet deeper than they were before the hurricanes, so it was very little light penetration. What we noticed was hydrilla was sprouting from the tubers, would grow about a foot tall, turn clear because not enough light, and die off. So in the water bodies where there wasn't that much um, light disruption, we could focus most of our, our management in those areas, so we were really able to get a, a hold on hydrilla. Something that you might not have a, a problem with in the delta, because I understand it doesn't ever go dry, 
But when a water body in Florida that has had water or hyacinth or water lettuce in it goes dry and then refloods, and we're just coming out of about a 10 year, uh, very significant drought in Florida, then water hyacinth and lettuce seeds that are in those sediments by the billions start to germinate. Um, so we know that when we're coming out of a drought, we need to set a lot of money aside to do a lot of very active water hyacinth and water lettuce control. Um, so this is how hyacinth control used to be done. Um, the crisis management up in the left side. Now it's, ooh, um, uh, boy, one minute left. Well, I'm not going to finish that, that's for sure. Um, Maintenance control you see down there. Small populations, a lot of frequent um, control operations to keep the, the plants at low levels. This is a 40-year history of water hyacinth control on the Suwannee River. A lot of management, a lot of plants, a lot of organics produced, a lot of herbicides used on the left-hand side. When maintenance control was implemented, you see that all that goes down. What you don't see is there's a lot of native plants along the shores of the Suwannee River now. Same thing statewide. This is a statewide graph where water hyacinth reached its apex in 1960s of about 125,000 acres in Florida public water standing at any one time. Um, since maintenance control, now we have about four or 5,000 acres at any one time in those million and a quarter acres of water. We still control about 35,000 acres of water hyacinth every year with herbicides and spend three or four million dollars doing that. So we still do a lot of control. Same thing with hydrilla. You see that um, bottom out in 2004, the red line. Um, that's where the hurricanes came in and the aggressive management started in there. But generally what this graph shows is when funding was low, hydrilla expanded. Uh, when we could get a lot of funding, we could bring hydrilla back to some other level, but not back to that level you see in 1982 because millions of tubers were also in those um, water bodies. So once we could deplete the tuber bank, especially after the hurricanes and the aggressive management, we now have hydrilla turned back to the levels that we saw back in the early 1980s. So wrapping up, our management decisions, we first identify the uses and functions, and that changes all the time, of Florida public water. So we update that all the time. We look to see what plant species are present in that system and how they might be impairing the water body. Do we have the technology to manage those plants selectively? Um, what are the current conditions and then what's the budget for that? We coordinate with a lot of federal, state, and local agencies. And we're required to reduce herbicides under NPDES regulations. We've been doing that for decades in Florida with early detection, rapid response, with maintenance control by integrating grass carp especially, but biocontrols. We've been very active with biocontrol releases. Uh, we look for the lowest effective rates when we're applying herbicides and the best time of year to apply herbicides to control plants. It's not this time of year. It's usually in February or March before water hyacinth or before hydrilla is a problem. Get onto it early. And wrapping up finally now, I'll give you the address for this website. It explains um, Florida's aquatic plant management program. It's on the University of Florida website, but that got hacked about three weeks ago. And it should be back up online within the next uh, few days, they tell me. But if you look at, um, go to that and look at section four, you'll see section three discusses all the management tools that we have av available. And then section four is for NPDES, um, our pesticide discharge management plan, explains how all of those tools are considered in developing our management programs. And especially the herbicides, it goes through the considerations for all 16 of those herbicide compounds, um, a list of about 25 different com considerations from plant physiology to water chemistry to water body morphology um, to dispersion of the herbicide, et cetera. So you can see all of the considerations that go into developing a, a herbicide management program. So those are all the agencies that I've worked for, even though it's been just the invasive plant management section in the state of Florida over the last 40 years. So thank you very much. And uh, for questions, I'm on the panel at 4 o'clock, so we can probably hold off on all those. So. I have a quick question. Yes, sir. How much water hyacinth per year can you control acres, cubic yards, on a mechanical basis? 
Mechanical harvesters usually can take out about um, two acres per day. If they're in deep enough water and away from obstructions, you not only have to take the hyacinth out of the system, but you have to dump it somewhere. And you normally can't dump that on somebody's shoreline or you can't dump it on a river bank because it's probably just gonna end up back in the river if the water level comes up overnight. So the, the biggest problem is the disposal. Um, and the Corps of Engineers did research years ago that for every mile you have to haul that plant either within the system to get it out of the water body or once you get it out of the system to go find a disposal site and then pay for tipping fees or spreading fees, um, you double the cost of, of the management. So um, hyacinth can weigh from 180 to 850 tons per acre wet weight. So that's what you're trying to pick up. The machines are certainly there capable of doing that. The problem is they haven't been able to keep up with the, the rapid growth, the doubling like you heard earlier today of seven to 12 days. And they certainly can't get into the foot or so of water. That's where the hyacinth, usually the remnants, if you get all the stuff that's out here, that's where the last stuff is. So you're constantly creating more hyacinth that flush out there. Plus in Florida, along those shorelines is native vegetation. So in order to get the hyacinth out, you're also harvesting the native vegetation and the hyacinth recover faster than the native vegetation. So after one or two cuttings, you've selected for water hyacinth along that shoreline. So we don't do much harvesting of water hyacinth anymore in Florida. We certainly do around bridges where we have to get it out of there immediately, uh, but the maintenance programs are almost all done with the biocontrols. We continue to look at that, but the active control is, her <coughs> excuse me, herbicides. Long answer to a very short yeah. question. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So we now have a, um, a scheduled break till um, uh, a quarter of, of three, uh, 2.45. Um, note that clock is a little fast, so Jeff was exactly on time. And we'll see you in uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes.